à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue à cette quatrième conférence du partenariat des nouveaux usages des collections dans les musées d'art, qui est organisée par le groupe de recherche et de réflexion SIECO, en partenariat avec le Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal. Welcome to the fourth conference of the partenariat New Use of Collection in Art Museums, organized by the SIECO Research and Reflection Group in partnership with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Aujourd'hui, nous avons la joie et le privilège d'accueillir Vince Diekan, euh, dirigé par Joanne Lamoureux, le partenariat des nouveaux usages des collections, rassemble 18 co-chercheurs canadiens et européens et, 8, et 6 collaborateurs pardon, issus euh, de 6 universités, en partenariat avec 6 musées canadiens pour explorer les nouveaux usages des collections dans les musées d'art. Les précédentes conférences ont permis d'explorer certains aspects des quatre axes de la recherche menés par le partenariat pour la collection citoyenne, Boris Vastiot est venu nous parler du plan stratégique du musée d'ethnographie de Genève. Pour la collection exposée, Adila Laïda Agnier a évoqué la construction des collections muséales sous occupation, sous occupation avec le cas du musée de Palestine. Et pour la collection augmentée, Catherine Wood de la Tate Moderne nous a parlé de ce que la performance fait au musée. Je suis Emmanuel château dutier je suis responsable de la collection partagée, l'axe qui porte sur la circulation numérique des collections et je suis ravi du coup d'accueillir Vince Diekan. Mais avant de présenter plus avant Vince, je voudrais d'abord donner la parole à Charlène Bélanger, chef de l'éducation et du mieux-être au Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal, qui co-organise cette conférence avec nous. Bonsoir et bienvenue. Good evening and welcome. Au nom du Musée des Beaux-Arts de Montréal, il me fait plaisir de vous accueillir ce soir dans cet événement virtuel co-présenté avec le partenariat CIECO des nouveaux usages des collections. On behalf of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event co-presented with the CECO partnership. Our special guest tonight, Vincent Ziekan from Monash University, will invite us to reflect on the many transformations and tensions triggered by the recent immersion of our museums in the digital culture. The talk will be presented in English. It will be followed by a question period in French or English at your convenience. Thank you for being with us tonight. À toi, Emmanuel. Alors, c'est vraiment un honneur pour nous de recevoir Vince Yekan pour cette conférence intitulée On Museums and Their Digital Immersion sur les musées et leur immersion numérique. Quelques mots pour vous présenter notre intervenant. Vince Yekan is a senior academic and practitioner researcher at Mona, Monash Art Design and Architecture, MADA, Monash University. Uh, in Australia. Vince works engaged with the transformation of contemporary curatorial practice at the intersection of the emerging design practice, creative technology and museum culture. The scope of this interdisciplinary investigation is reflected in his book, Virtuality and the Art of the Ex Exhibition, Curatorial Design for the Multimedia Museum, and more recently in the Rutledge Handbook of Museum Media and Communication. Uh, Vince dirige également une collection sur uh, les, le sujet de la muséologie numérique avec uh, Ross Perry uh, et c'est vraiment un des pionniers en fait uh, des recherches uh, dans ce domaine et donc nous avons beaucoup de chance uh, de pouvoir l'entendre pour nous parler uh, de la transformation des musées à un moment où à l'issue uh, de la Covid la question du numérique est devenue de plus en plus prévalente et, uh, et, et, et précisément uh, Immersive. Uh, donc, c'est à vous, uh, Vince. Uh, please, Vince, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'll uh, share my screen just to make sure we're looking at the same thing. There we are. I hope everything that's uh, come across okay for everybody. So yes, I'd uh, just like to say before we start, just uh, again, uh, hello, hello from Melbourne, uh, where it is uh, Friday morning, uh, early Friday morning. So uh, welcome to the future. Um, it's it's a pleasure to to be here, um, albeit virtually. Um, but again, I'd just like to before starting, just thank everybody involved uh, from uh, Sieco. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, Joan, and also, of course, uh, everybody else who's been involved in hosting. Um, and thank you, Charlene, um, again, from uh, the Montreal uh, Musée de Beaux-Arts. So um, to, to begin, um, as I've kind of indicated, you know, we're, we're speaking from a really kind of uh, unique vantage here where, I guess, in a sense, the past and the future are meeting across times and places. 
Um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to begin by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and recognize continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as uh, introduced, I'm Vince Zekin. Um, I've um, uh, been researching and practicing in this field of uh, curatorial practice at the intersection of digital technology and the museum for probably about 25 years now. Um, and my research engages in a highly interdisciplinary way, um, looking and is interested in looking at the continuing transformation, transformations of contemporary curatorial practice at the intersection of design, creative technology, and museum culture. Very quickly, um, these are some of my uh, current roles. Um, I am based here at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I am originally uh, from Montreal, uh, believe it or not. This is a, a really nice coincidence um, for us to discover together, but uh, I'm originally from Montreal uh, before uh, continuing uh, in a westward direction um, and uh, studied at Emily Carr in Vancouver before uh, continuing on to Australia and basically hit, hit land across the Pacific. And I've been based in Melbourne um, since and based here at Monash University, where I'm currently our director of international programs in the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture um, Department of Design. Um, some of my roles um, include uh, currently being general editor of a uh, publication project for Bloomsbury, the Encyclopedia of New Media Art, which I'll speak about briefly. Um, I'm also series editor of Critical Perspectives on Museums and Digital Technology, which is a new book series um, that I've developed with my colleague Ross Perry from the University of Leicester in the UK. Uh, for Routledge, and I'll hopefully have some time at the end of the presentation to introduce you um, a little bit more to that project, because I would hope there might be some flow through um, sort of impact from uh, the project uh, that you're working on in particular and how we might be able to collaborate potentially in the future. I've also been the founding curator of MWX, which is where some of my practice based research gets applied through the museums and the web. Um, my research affiliations are based here at Monash in our Sensi Lab, which is an interdisciplinary lab that connects um, art and design and information technology. And I'll share some work related to that as part of my presentation. Also the university's Data Futures Institute and a new institute that I'm involved in at the University of Leicester, uh, which is soon to be launched which is the Institute of Digital Culture. And I'll be, um, an, I am an advisor and will be an adjunct of that program. So again, I will talk through some of these. Um, in terms of previous publications, as was introduced in, in the introduction before, these are two um, sort of books of mine, uh, Virtuality and the Art of Exhibition, which I'll be revisiting in part as part of this presentation and updating some of the ideas that I kind of introduced in that in relation to our discussion today. Um, and also the uh, Routledge Handbook of Museums, Media and Communication that I had the pleasure of, of working on with uh, colleagues in Europe, uh, Kirsten Drotner and Kim Schroeder, and also Ross Perry. Um, these books um, are obviously available to you. And I guess, uh, importantly, uh, the Routledge Handbook in particular is uh, recently been available, made available as open access. So I would certainly uh, welcome everybody um, to um, take advantage of, of that opportunity to um, engage with some of the ideas that we've outlined there. So the presentation, um, and I should preempt, I will hopefully be able to keep this to probably 45 minutes. Um, I will try and fast track perhaps some bits um, just to kind of keep things moving along, uh, but I'll be doing my best uh, in that way. Uh, the title of the talk is on museums and their digital emerging, and I'll be covering in structure some, um, I guess, kind of uh, themes, those being on curating cultural architectures, 
on designing cultural systems within techno-social systems, on experimentation and creative technology, and on curatorial design and collections. To preview or preempt some of those discussions, um, I will quickly kind of just introduce some forthcoming projects um, that I'm currently engaged with, which have um, filtered into the uh, talk that I'm doing for us here today. Um, the first of those publications relates to the Encyclopedia of New Media Art, where in addition to um, acting or serving as general editor, I'm also working very directly on one of those three volumes, that being the volume related to new media art, curation and culture. And I'm working on that with a colleague of mine from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Anna Munster. In brief, the Encyclopedia of New Media Art is an ambitious publication that aims to provide a comprehensive, internationalized, scholarly and reflective account of new media art. It's structured into three volumes. The first volume on history and theory is based on the notion that new media art is a highly complex phenomenon that has multiple origins in various artistic and cultural developments that can go beyond a focus on the visual arts and the avant-garde to embrace areas such as craft, mathematics, music, engineering, cybernetics, and literature. These disparate phenomena that constitute the histories of new media art will be covered from the 19th century through to the early 21st, from the pre-digital to the post-digital. The second volume, focusing on artists and practice, examines the myriad approaches to new media, both individual and collective since 1900, but with a focus on the key period from the 1980s to today, and their overlaps with other aspects of art theory, curation, and exhibition. The final volume, the one that I'm working on with Anna Munster, is focusing on curation and culture, and it attends to resonant contextual factors related to new media. The first section on curating examines the implications of new media art for the theory and practice of curation, museology, technology, and cultural heritage as digitization and the accelerated development of networked interface and display technologies have resulted in new methods of cultural production and have also encouraged a rethinking of the theory, practice, and politics of curation, both inside and outside the museum. The second section addresses the so social, political, economic, and institutional contexts of new media art from the 1960s onwards by examining historical themes alongside the specific cultural forms that have become enmeshed with new media art and other forms of techno culture. The second section of, of my talk today will uh, draw upon some work that I'm uh, currently developing for a, another publication, this being on museums and technologies of presence. And I'll be contributing a book chapter to that book, uh, which will be published next year by Routledge, um, focusing on designing cultural experiences within techno-social systems. In brief, museums are and have always been mixed reality spaces par excellence. Today, digital technologies are further extending the ways in which the wealth of cultural ma of material culture they contain can be interpreted, exhi exhibited, and experienced, presenting new and previously unimaginable ways of bringing their stories to life. This chapter proposes a critical examination of how immersive and other, te other emerging technologies, including virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and remote sensing technologies such as photogrammetry, affect our sense of presence and, in so doing, the relationship between embodied experience and technological mediation. In the final sections of my talk, I'll be sort of drawing upon work that is currently underway for two further publications, both of those falling within the remit of the new critical perspectives on museums and digital technology book series. Um, two of those projects I have a direct involvement in. Both of these projects are due for publication early next year. The first of those is on museums and digital confidence 
um, organization, collection and interface. And this is a book that I'm working on um, as co-editor with Ross Perry and Karen de Vilde uh, from the University of Leiden in uh, Holland. In brief, uh, digital technology has changed the ways that museums manage collections, conduct research, shape exhibitions, and build relationships with their stakeholders and audiences. But despite more than 50 years of computer-enabled development and associated digital transformation, or disruption, if you prefer, the sector as a whole can still be found to doubt its ability to not just face, but embrace the ongoing challenges presented by our, high, our highly interconnected, media pervasive, technologized world. Where does this lack of digital confidence come from and why does it still exist? This book explores the evolving nature of digital confidence in museums, why it is faltered at times, why it matters, especially at this time, and how it may flourish now and as an integral part of the museum's post-digital future. And finally, um, Museums and Design Practices, uh, a book that I'm co-authoring with Marco Mason, who's a scholar based at the uh, Northumbria University in the UK. We'll be focusing on design, in particular, the way that design finds itself playing an increasingly integral role across the everyday working culture of museums by underwriting their ability to react and respond to the emerging context of the digitally mature museum. This book will advocate design as practice, a position that departs from orthodoxies about design thinking in order to open up new lines of critical inquiry about human-centered design by turning its focus towards emerging design practices that facilitate creativity, support collaboration, and promote more inclusive, explorative, and experimental museum cultures. So those projects, as I said, um, are front of mind in terms of the current research that I'm doing. And I'll be uh, filtering um, some of the ideas uh, that are being um, advanced in those uh, projects, and also background some underlying concepts um, that I hope will be of, of interest and relevance um, to um, everybody here today, um, focusing on museums and their digital immersion. So to begin, museums find themselves within a mediatized society where everyday life is conducted in a data full and technology rich context. In fact, museums are themselves mediatized and as such, they present a uniquely media centered environment in which communicative media is a constitutive property of their organization and the cultural experiences they offer their visitors. The ubiquity of digital culture and proliferation of new technology infrastructures, ranging from large scale media projections and immersive sensory environments through to mobile distributed and extended reality experiences, test how we, come, how we have come to know and understand the spatio-temporal dimensions of cultural experience in the wake of the digital revolution. And this reconfiguration can be recognized through an ever closer correspondence between virtual and physical spaces in the cultural architectures that have come to define their exhibitionary conditions. And while the museum or gallery still remains the default zone for much art, the curatorial programming of the post-digital museum takes into account a greatly expanded constellation of spaces, formats, and event structures, which place particular demands on curating new kinds of museum experiences arising from the increasing overlap and convergence of spatial practices and digital mediation across the widest range of museum practices, including institutional strategies and the development of new platforms and infrastructures. And so to just introduce this um, uh, kind of slideshow that I'm going to walk through in this next section, I'm just juxtaposing these two um, sort of examples um, to kind of introduce and establish that kind of overlap between what we know and understand as being digital and what we 
know and understand as space or spatial and how we can see in these types of immersive um, uh, experiences on the one hand uh, a large scale installation of a rio giacada work this being here at the uh, the armory in new york and one of the um, pieces that was commissioned for the turbine hall by Miroslav Balka, the Polish artist, um, that again sort of uh, expands our understanding of what uh, cultural experience of contemporary art um, involves. To, to take us through, I guess, a little bit of a kind of a whistle stop <laughs> tour um, of, of different um, ideas around um, museums and kind of museum culture. I'm starting here with this um, cutaway um, sort of visualization, this engraving um, that's uh, representing the John Soane Museum in London. And this is again uh, an example of kind of the early uh, beginnings of what we have come to know um, in Western culture as the museum. And it builds from, I guess, a premise where the collection is the museum. The collection becomes the museum. Um, John Soane's collection is, in effect, um, amassed knowledge. Okay, and this was an amassed knowledge of one person. Okay, a British architect who, in his life's work and in his own kind of uh, experience and travel, uh, in the wake of kind of the Grand Tour, um, he basically, in a very colonial way, brought back. Okay, to London these material artifacts that document those experiences that represent in a sense those cultural tra traditions and his collection was effectively used as a teaching tool uh, originally for him and the students that he would work with who would be training as architects to expose them to those ideas by visiting his house in london of course when he passed away he um, bequeathed his house to the British government. And to this day, the Soane Museum continues to um, be open and available to, to audiences to um, explore and to, I guess, be amazed by, okay, this particular time capsule of, of what the museum uh, was. So the transition, in a sense, that the museum took Okay, from being this kind of private collection and teaching tool, pedagogical tool, into a experience, into something that became part of a, um, a bourgeois culture um, in, in London, um, is represented here in this um, sort of illustration from a, from a newspaper of the time, showing okay, the idea of people visiting the museum and it becoming this social kind of event, this social um, uh, sort of experience uh, for people to come together. And this extends to this day. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has had the chance to visit the Soane Museum who's here, but um, I personally recall spending probably three hours uh, lined up around the block on a rainy kind of winter night in London, waiting to kind of get in for one of the monthly um, evening openings where the museum can be kind of um, experienced in the way that people back in the 1800s did by walking through the museum under torchlight to actually um, experience the collection. So again, you know, the, the way that that, um, as part of the experience economy, is now working today is just an interesting trajectory of how museum culture has evolved. And of course, that evolution continues into the digital and this is where we see um, another way of experiencing the Soane Museum in a fully online, digital, virtual mode uh, being recreated here through photogrammetry by ScanLab, where the entire museum can actually be um, explored as a fully digital um, experience. Of course, to get to photogrammetry, we have to move through photography. Um, and um, when we think about the movement also from the 19th century to the 20th, we see the museum um, sort of move into, I guess, uh, it's kind of influenced by image culture at large. And of course, 
the concept um, and theorization of that by Andre Malraux, for one, uh, with his idea of the anglicized museum without walls, um, is again an interesting juxtaposition with ScanLab, where in a sense we're able to experience the museum uh, kind of through the walls, you know, through this kind of almost like X-ray um, access to everywhere um, sort of mode. And of course, that idea of working through the wall or through the screen as it has evolved is something that again we see as uh, digital technologies now are means of accessing collections um, in um, these kind of image based ways. This being uh, Gallery One at the Cleveland Museum of Art, where the introductory gallery um, enables visitors to come in literally scan and scour the entire collection uh, virtually a kind of a, a gallery scaled Google search of sorts. Um, and of course, as part of the museum experience, uh, the use of the Art Lens app enables visitors to actually select artworks of interest that pick their curiosity in this mode, download them to their mobile phones, and in the process, actually build for themselves a self-guided tour where they'll be able to actually um, find those particular works that are on display and see them kind of curated into an itinerary for their visit. The impact of, of image culture and subsequently media culture on museums has kind of changed what we understand the museum experience to be and what we kind of look um, at museums for, you know, how we sort of understand them socially and culturally um, in our media age, let's say. The beginnings, of course, of that um, occurred back in the 1960s. And again, being somebody who was weaned on McLuhan uh, growing up in Canada, um, you know, we see the museum perhaps with a particular lens now as being uh, media. And I'm just illustrating here an example of um, that I'm very familiar with here in Melbourne, uh, this being the National Gallery of Victoria, where back in the 1960s, in 1968, the museum um, uh, commissioned a new, a new site, a new building. And this is an, arch uh, an architect's rendering of the impression of what that building would be like. And if we look at this image, we can read a whole range of different codes uh, that are inherited from history, uh, reflected in that visualization of what this imagined museum would be like. Um, the fortress-like entrance um, is something that is a real kind of um, evident feature um, of this particular site, the idea that it houses a treasure and that in some ways it also is kind of protecting the inside of the museum from the outside around it. And that of course is even marked here by this um, sort of guard um, on a, a horse mounted guard on a statue, which um, thankfully was never actually commissioned. But the rest of the building is still very much like that. And in fact, you can't quite see it in this image, but that fortress like uh, facade is actually ringed by a water feature. And of course that conveys this idea of even a moat. So once again, that idea of the museum being this kind of protected space, separating inside from outside um, is what was inherited. And that has obviously changed as we've moved into the late 20th century and into the 21st, where we see the museum serving a different purpose and a different range of functions. And so 30 years after uh, the development of the National Gallery, um, the museum itself expanded to a second site, a second campus, as of course many other large-scale international museums did around the same time. And this here is a, a digital rendering this time of an architect's visualization from the lab architecture studios that developed the National Gallery of Victoria Australia campus, the Ian Potter Center. And when we look at this particular visualization of the, um, the still to be built version of the museum, what we see is a space that is probably 
more akin to a airport uh, waiting uh, lounge, you know, being in transit, um, flying through LAX or something is kind of like what you see here or a shopping mall. Um, and again, that points to this kind of a, uh, evolution in terms of sort of media culture and also where museums fit into that um, resulting attention economy. Of course, digital culture has kind of extended um, that even further. And now it's quite commonplace for us to see and experience these types of mediated experiences, both inside and outside the museum. And in some ways then the blurring of those edges is what I'm illustrating here with Pipilotti wrists recent installation at LACMA, alongside um, this project from 10 years ago by, by Doug Aiken, where in effect the museum itself, this being the Hirshhorn in Washington, its circumference became literally a cinematic screen um, for his project Song One. Of course, emerging technologies have kind of, again, blurred where we actually find ourselves when we have a museum-based experience. Are we inside? Are we outside? Are we somewhere else? And of course, virtual reality is one type of uh, technology that um, puts that uh, into question. Um, and of course, very innovative um, efforts have been made, including I'm aware of kind of Marshmallow Laser Feast having kind of um, had a, had a major run in Montreal at the Phi Center, um, but I'm illustrating again that phenomenon here with uh, Carne Arena, which is the project by Alessandro Iñárritu um, that has kind of again toured globally, uh, this being an image of it installed at the Fondazione Prada in Milan. And I guess lastly, in terms of that slideshow that I wanted to introduce you to some of these um, sort of evolving ideas around the mediatization of the museum, we can't of course uh, not um, reflect, and in fact, we're still living it of course, even in this mode tonight, um, where we're talking about the impact that the pandemic has had um, on our understandings of cultural experience and the role that museums play in sustaining us and sustaining those and maintaining um, relevance and connectivity with audiences, even through periods of shutdown. So this image here, of course, predates um, digital. It pre, it's pre-modern in the sense that this is Ole Verm's um, a kind of apartment in Copenhagen, where basically his museum uh, collection lined the walls, floors, and ceilings of his apartment. Um, but of course, our experience of the museum coming to us in our own living rooms, in our own bedrooms um, during the pandemic is something that this image, um, in a sense, conveys. So that return, in a way, uh, recognizing kind of that return to Ole Verm's, uh, you know, the Museum of Vermerium, as it was referred to, made me also return. Um, and in this, putting this presentation together, I reflected back on um, a keynote lecture that was given 20 years ago by Manuel Casals at the um, ICOM General Conference in 2001, where Casals explores and uh, proposes um, a way of thinking about the capacities of the museum to intervene in the types of contradictions that digital was bringing about during the information age. And Casal's um, lecture touches on three kind of main points that speak to this kind of issue around communication of kind of being um, localized and connected through to being global and connected, but also how they can find ourselves sort of lost in that or disconnected in that sort of uh, media scape. And Casals points to three different ways that we can think of the museum and things that museums do that are challenged by that particular digital condition. 
he refers to this idea of real virtuality, this idea that reality is not something separate, um, but rather something that is the way that we do interact and experience the world. So reality is virtual and culture is therefore a culture of that type of reality. We're also, he also raises this idea of the museum being a place that um, is about time. It doesn't just um, contain collections. It also houses time and temporality and is able to activate time in different ways. So this idea of uh, atemporal time. And he also, of course, draws on a concept that he, he takes up further in his major works like the Network Society, where he talks about the space of flows and how museums, in a way, can sort of form and also perform that type of spatiality and the way that we find ourselves um, understanding spaces and understanding ourselves through our interactions with space. He does touch on three museums to illustrate those concepts. Um, and he kind of draws upon the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao um, as one of those examples. And of course, the Guggenheim Bilbao was kind of a new museum, um, you know, shortly, uh, you know, opened before his uh, talk at ICOM. Um, that again marks that kind of period of museum transformation in the late 20th century and this type of a uh, different type of space for us to see a museum and to understand a museum and how collections and exhibitions would be formed in it. Of course, he then also kind of touched on the Tate. He also recognized the San Jose Technology Museum as being other examples that kind of mark the, the territory that he was highlighting in that lecture. And interestingly, in the last 20 years, what we have seen is that a museum like the Guggenheim Bilbao, which he looked at particularly through that idea uh, or that lens of real virtuality, has of course now become probably more like what he was talking about um, identifying the San Jose Museum as being the space of flows, as being a space informed fully by digital. What we see here is that uh, you know, the Guggenheim itself has only recently sort of opened a new gallery space, a new introductory gallery called Zero, which has been designed by local projects, the uh, New York-based uh, design museum design uh, firm, to create this immersive uh, visual experience for visitors um, before they actually kind of then engage with the rest of the museum. So this idea of kind of the space of flows, this uh, the, the way that I have kind of sort of engaged with those ideas in my own work, goes back to some of the ideas that I um, proposed in the um, book, uh, Virtuality and the Art of Exhibition, in which I kind of develop its thesis, uh, being inspired in some ways by this uh, double helix idea. Um, the double helix being, of course, the, the base of DNA. And you know, for me, it was a way of conceptualizing what otherwise would be seen as separate tracks and binary relationships as being things that are much more intertwined and interrelated. And so in the book, the thesis that I advanced there touches on those ideas. It covers these different um, sort of main subjects leading towards this concept of curatorial design. But in terms of the um, argumentation of that, what I'm kind of trying to develop with that schema is this idea of how museums do follow a particular type of time track through that helix, where we kind of move in a sense from a presentational mode, where we think about the art of exhibition being about display, about static objects, about freezing objects in time. And in fact, seeing that that temporality kind of changes as we sort of move that through ideas around spatial practice into curatorial design and beyond where things become more performative in many ways and collections as an example are not static any longer but much more dynamic in nature. We also see a spatial track that allows us to move from the idea of represent you know the more representational aspect of virtuality 
spirituality, the idea that other spaces can be represented in a way pictorially. So again, going back to the Renaissance or even further back, of course, into um, early um, art history. But the idea that virtuality and the way that we represent the virtual has also kind of changed because of the digital means, the digital, you know, what digital media allows us to do and how that has in turn changed how we, uh, you know, how we use museums as sites of exhibition. So we move from this idea of a more representational mode into a more actuated mode where the museum becomes uh, somehow operational in how we understand space. That concept or that theory um, has kind of continued to sort of evolve in my own work. And what I'm illustrating here is how those tracks do um, continue as we move um, and continue to move this idea forward. And here I'm connecting cultural architecture and curatorial programming to concepts that I've been developing over recent work. Where they fit into this kind of evolving schema is really kind of to mark, okay, the, the transition that we have come through from a digital era into a post-digital one. And whereas that dynamic of spatial practice and digital mediation could be seen as being kind of the crux of the matter when we're talking about understanding digital and how we actually adopt digital in museums. Today, as we see media and we experience the world in more kind of uh, ubiqu ubiquitous ways, um, we see that we've entered into a post-digital phase and here it's now between this idea of how we curatorially program the museum and how the museum itself needs to be understood as a cultural architecture. So that actually takes us to, to where I'd like to now um, move on with some of the new ideas here around this. And I'll start by looking at the Tate which of course was one of the examples that um, uh, Cassell's touched on in his um, lecture as well. But here we see a coincidence of sorts between space and digital reflected in work in the turbine hall and also work that was produced for the net art commissioning program um, of the Tate in the early uh, 2000s. So briefly, while emerging in response to immediate digital circumstances of its time, the Tate offered a way of grounding the post-digital conditions. Developments that were initially announced by the Tate for the Tate Gallery of Modern Art, as it was originally uh, referred to back in the early 1990s, through to the turn of the millennium, when Herzog and de Muron um, sort of architecturally reimagined uh, the decommissioned Bankside power station into Tate Modern, these demonstrate how the interactions between cultural content, the museum and its audience are catalyzed by the mediating function that cultural architectures and their associated curatorial programs play. The diversification of the Tate and its network across this transformative period extended to four physical campuses. So moving from the original Millbank Tate Gallery now to Tate Modern and further to campuses in St. Ives and Liverpool was extended even further by the establishment of its dedicated web presence in 1998. And this was referred to and promoted as the Tate's fifth gallery, the mandate of which Tate Online was initially described by its curator, Matthew Gansalo, as a platform for more research experiments and dialogue in museum curating and presenting new media. How might gallery going audiences relate to online exhibitions was a question. How, how can the virtuality associated with computer and internet be experienced within the physical spaces of the museum? These vexed relationships precipitated one of the most intriguing commissions of the Tate's dedicated net art commissioning program, that being Susan Collins's Tate in Space. That artwork blended seamlessly into the Tate's institutional website and was designed in accordance with its style guide 
and even adopted its corporate language. Um, it presented itself, therefore, as an almost believable curatorial program. In the accompanying essay that was posted as part of the project, it was rhetorically argued that no artwork encapsulates the reality neutral position of the web quite so succinctly as Tate in space. However, following the tr transition from web 1.0 to web 2.0 eras that we've experienced over the intervening years, it's become abundantly clear that the internet is anything but neutral or removed from reality. Rather, they are deeply intertwined and let alone if we anticipate the next iteration or evolutionary phase of the internet as web 3.0, which could bring even greater decentralization, increased pervasiveness and new capabilities of AI and machine learning. So deliberately causing a suspension of disbelief in the mind of the visitor, the disorientation that Tate and Space achieved draws attention to the contentious separation of the artwork it's perceived aesthetic autonomy in the rarefied zero gravity parameters of the white cube from the mediatized context to which the museum finds itself grounded. The unsettling relationship created between the nearly perfect registration of the artwork, its overt creative fiction or veiled institutional critique um, with its museological interface draws particular attention to how curatorial programming mediates the institution's public programs. And while the net art commissioning program lasted for a year, or for 10 years, I should say, and wrapped up in the early, around uh, 2012, those digital programs continued and continue to this day. And I'm just illustrating here an example of work that was produced uh, as part of the IK prize. Uh, and I think that inaugurated in 2014 and this is a project by the workers, uh, London-based design studio um, called After Dark, in which um, an internationally connected global audience uh, was able to um, uh, drive a series of robots through the closed uh, Tate Britain at night with a searchlight to actually interact and explore the museum uh, via remote control. Um, of course, this image here makes me think very much about the situation we're finding ourselves in here, talking in little tiles um, on our desktop screens. I'll move quickly now through the final parts of the presentation, and I'm kind of conscious of time, so I would like to, to come maybe fast track a few things um, just to kind of get to some questions at the end. But um, on designing cultural experiences within techno-social systems, is another sort of topic area that I'd like to um, put forward here. And so the conditions that I've been discussing to this point have underscored the establishment of an entire subset of new organizations. And these encompass pioneering institutions dedicated to new media art, from ZKM to Ars Electronica, through to the foundation of art and creative technology in Liverpool, um, along with museums of film and video and moving image that include the Australian Centre for the Moving Image here in Melbourne that was established in 2001. And again, within this sort of generation, within this 20 year period, we've actually seen the museum take advantage in some respects of the pandemic uh, and the closure. And again, I'm sure you'd be aware that Melbourne, I think globally experienced the world's longest um, uh, sort of enforced lockdown period. Um, during that time, ACME reinvented itself and has only recently reopened uh, with an entirely new uh, fit out, entirely new kind of gallery experiences um, during that time. And I'm illustrating two of those here from the introductory gallery, which in a sense points to kind of old media and connects through to the final gallery that people would experience as part of the permanent collection, where we end up in this constellation space at the end. So innovative, which involves innovative applications of, of digital technology. Innovative, 
in innovative applications of such technologies, um, such as the lens, which is the, the new kind of interface developed here for the ACME experience, but also represented by um, Gallery One at Cleveland that we touched on, the photography gallery at SF MoMA, developed by Second Story, who also had a hand in the development of uh, the lens, as well as Tate Modern's ecosystem of digital spaces, which have been created under the Bloomberg Connects umbrella, um, show um, have all contributed towards blurring, if not fully transcending the boundaries of physical and digital. And so this willingness to innovate, this um, bravery in terms of taking on the challenge of new technologies and figuring out how they can be used and utilized is where I'd just like to touch on, I guess, the importance of um, experimentation and the importance of collaboration between the sectors, in a sense, between the creative industries, between universities and academia and the uh, cultural sector in terms of museums, uh, galleries, libraries and archives, the glam sector. And I'm just gonna quickly illustrate sort of three PhD projects that I personally have the pleasure of, of supervising at the moment through Sensi Lab, uh, which is our dedicated interdisciplinary lab here at Monash to those overlaps between um, creative practice-based um, art and design experimentation and the use of new and emerging creative technologies. So this is a project by Nina Rajic uh, called Mirror Ritual, uh, which was recently shown at ZKM, in which visitors experience um, or, or basically are able to uh, interact with a mirror in which a poem will emerge gradually through that mirror interface, uh, which has been generated by AI and machine learning um, based on the uh, visitor's emotional uh, range. So in a sense, through facial recognition and the corpus, the idea is that a unique original poem will be generated directly in response to that person as part of that museum-based experience. Work by Oscar Raby, uh, this being um, a applied piece of his research looking into extended reality. Um, this is a particular project uh, using AR uh, based on a uh, particular cultural heritage site uh, here in Melbourne called Ripon Lee, which is a colonial mansion um, with a very um, kind of a Victorian era garden landscape in which this AR piece um, explores that space, but explores it in a way that rather than thinking about um, sort of scanning the environment kind of laterally, this VR piece is intended to explore the space in a vertical axis, which actually is a means of unearthing the histories and the strata of this space that extend back to Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous connection to site. So the cultural heritage aspect of this um, is one that is trying to connect the present day through sound primarily as being the means of interfacing, but also visuals that allow you to scan in that sort of way, the past and the present. And the third project that I just wanted to briefly touch on is Lucia Ivsic's, um, sorry, if that didn't come out quite right. Lucia Ivsic um, is the designer of this piece. Um, it's a, a VR experience called What Homes Are Made Of, in which her environment is scanned through photogrammetry and a piece that is meant to um, convey and evoke a more kind of emotional response to sight and to space by connecting it back to cultural memories um, and memories of different times and different places and co-locating them from her home in Croatia into her temporary apartment here in Melbourne. So finally, to kind of uh, move to the final uh, portion of what I'd like to present then, um, and recognizing that in terms of the SIECO project, uh, there's of course a really important emphasis on how do we animate and activate and utilize collections within this um, sort of uh, context, this digital context or post-digital context. 
Uh, I'd just like to touch on some things then relating finally to curatorial design and collections. And I might step through these quite, quite quickly in the interest of time. So new media has instigated certain challenges of how we define, understand, and practice the museum in bo as both an institution and as a space. The advent of distributable media has significantly impacted upon contemporary aesthetic practices and consequently, consequently has induced a shift in long established institutionalized practices from ones premised by forms that emphasize physical space and objectification through to those of a more virtual orientation informed by digital te technologies and their various applications. As eminent new media curator Christiane Paul once pronounced, she said ongoing developments in digital and information technologies would affect the nature and structure of arts organizations and institutions in the coming decades and change the role of arts spaces in the broadest sense. And she was speaking, you know, in 2008, making those kind of, um, you know, advanced um, prognostications. Um, and these ideas then would transcend the pre-established physical and imposed conceptual boundaries of the gallery and the museum itself. And, and, and that has meant that um, these combined technological and aesthetic developments have challenged the contemporary museum to rethink the institution's material interface in response to a default condition that has become increasingly virtualized and mediatized to the point whereby, as Nicholas Borio has said, the space where works of art are displayed becomes altogether the space of interaction. And the illustration that I'm using here is an image of a performance work by a Parici and Pelmus called Public Collections that was part of an event hosted at Tate Liverpool that I had the pleasure of also performing in where the exhibition, uh, which was a, a, an exhibition originally titled um, Works to Know by Heart, an Imagine Museum, the closing event of that exhibition was a two-day um, event called 2053, A Living Museum, whereby all the works that had previously um, been situated in the galleries had been removed and the space was left empty, empty vitrines, empty walls uh, with still kind of, you know, the, the nail holes in them. In place of the actual objects were people. And those people in various ways performed the artwork that would have existed in that space. And those were musicians, artists, curators, um, people from the general public, audience members. It was a very, very interesting two-day event that kind of illustrated this idea that museums are not only objects, but they're the way that we keep those objects with us, the way that they resonate, and the way that um, even if they're not there, they can be there through us and our interactions in that space. That experience um, has also informed, I guess, kind of a range of curatorial projects that I personally had the good fortune to, to use as experimental um, you know, practice-based research platforms for myself. Those have included uh, reactivating a set of works produced by visiting artists over a 10-year program at our uh, university's center in Italy at the Monash University Prato Center where I produced an exhibition called Art is Archive, Archive is Art. And that exhibition um, restaged works produced by artists during those uh, itinerant residency periods and kind of located them and performed them over a three day period within that space in different ways. And that same idea, I guess, of kind of um, using time and space and performance was also a strategy that I employed in uh, the exhibition MWX 2018 Open Platform, which I produced for the museums and the web conference in Vancouver. We're also over a kind of um, a contained period, a three day sort of conference period. We commissioned different artists work as part of that. 
that one of those being this project here called When is a Museum, where over the three day period, this structure that you see here in the, um, the center of the space, this kind of shelf type unit was actually um, transformed from being in the first instance, a museum that was basically a collecting institution where people, um, delegates to the conference could donate or loan a personal object to the museum. And then over the two day period, the next two day period, those objects were turned into mementos, curios, objects that on the final day, the space was rotated around and effectively turned into a gift shop where those objects were both returned and repatriated back to those lenders, but also um, copies made available, okay, as a gift shop. This is a, a, a really developed strategy of where um, from the ground up, literally, the idea of a museum conceiving itself with digital in mind. Um, this is the London Mithraeum, which um, is a site in London where uh, the Temple of Mithras, which was a Roman temple going back, I think like 200 AD, was rediscovered in the 1950s in East London um, during uh, as, as kind of post-war excavations of that area were being undertaken. This, this site, this um, historical archeological site was discovered there below ground. And more recently, um, Bloomberg has kind of bankrolled um, sort of that site, that building and created this London Mithraeum um, you know, museum. Uh, the site itself is around three layers, uh, three descending layers which also kind of illustrate how the sedimentation of London has changed over the centuries. But on the ground level, you have this kind of uh, sort of quite conventional appearing museum based experience where objects are displayed in these display cases. You can, of course, interact with them through iPads in terms of interpretive media. Um, on the mezzanine layer, one down, you end up with this sort of digital kind of immersive experience of being able to interact with these 3D printed facsimiles of relics and certain atmospheric qualities are also introduced into the space. But certainly the key um, sort of showstopper, let's say of this site is on the third and lowest level where above the actual site of the um, temple, there is a recreation of that space created as an audio visual immersive experience kind of using kind of laser and kind of fog and haze technologies to in a sense convey the more maybe ritualized and kind of uh, religious um, kind of type of experience that that site would have originally kind of been intending to serve. As part of that design of that museum, we also have a curatorial program introduced alongside it, which is part of the Bloomberg Space Program, um, commissions artists to produce works that are then displayed within the context of that space. This is Susan Hiller's project called London Jukebox, which I believe would be the last work that Susan produced before passing away, um, where basically the jukebox contains, I think, 70 some odd um, sort of soundtracks of different songs, popular songs um, that um, relate to London. And so again, as a form of archeology span in its own right, people can kind of experience that soundtrack um, while they're actually um, here in the introductory or entrance galleries of the museum before continuing with the rest of the show. Similar type projects um, that kind of are again sort of testing and experimenting with ways of uh, employing collections and making them available. Um, this is work by a, a, um, a Melbourne based design firm called Sandpit, who work extensively in the museum sector. This is a project called Mapomatic, where they took the collection of the State Library of Victoria, which has its own gallery and collection. And it's a very encyclopedic collection as a library collection kind of should. It covers kind of uh, all sorts of ephemera, all sorts of weird and wonderful objects. And what Mapomatic does is allow visitors to actually 
um, select certain objects and draw or infer unseen or serendipitous connections between those. So if a visitor says, I kind of like object A and object C, they might find that the system that underwrites, okay, the, um, the interface that you see here, the physical interface, it'll say, oh, here's a third object that you should kind of look at in that way. And this is why you, you know, what you can see in that. So again, it creates a more serendipitous way of exploring a collection. This is Museum in a Box, uh, which is a, a research project by George Oates um, and her design firm, uh, Good Form and Spectacle, um, that employs 3D um, technology, 3D printing technology to create uh, objects that can kind of interface with um, sound through RFID and NFC technologies to relay stories that have been captured um, around those objects or around the collection that's been created from them. Uh, this, I think, being an example of the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, um, sort of the museum in a box that was created um, in relation to that museum. And just to finish up, um, this is current work that I'm currently involved in. I'm involved in a research project along with our uh, researchers in Sensi Lab and the university's Inclusive Technology Lab, where we're currently sort of developing a project um, and a program for inclusive museum experiences for public galleries here in Australia. And we've had the good fortune of working with one of our regional galleries, the Bendigo Art Gallery, um, to do some design interventions as part of recent exhibitions that they've been holding. This is the current exhibition, which is um, the exhibition Elvis from Grace, uh, from uh, direct from Graceland, which is actually a, a collection based show uh, from the Graceland Museum um, that has been restaged here in, in Australia. And these are some of the experiences that our Sensi Lab researchers have developed as part of a curated. Um, sort of gallery um, that I had the, the, the role in, um, which we titled Can't Help Falling in Love with You, which basically creates a series of um, interactive experiences with sound and physical touch um, by um, employing that sort of Elvis song and manipulating it and manipulating the physical interfaces in different ways. So that basically is the um, conclusion of what I wanted to show. I might literally just wrap up if you will allow me just to kind of put a bit of a full stop on the presentation. Um, the digital transformation of museums has unfolded as a series of continuous disruptions. Seeing the adoption of the networked economies and technologies of the internet age underscore a restaging of how museums their collections and the cultural values they embody are understood and activated. This steady state of digital immersion continues to exert an influence on how we understand the museum as a cultural institution, the authority it claims, the values it extols, and the relationships it creates with other spheres of public life, including the political, economic, social, and technological spheres. Increasingly, we find ourselves engaging with the museum within a techno-social system, one through which cultural experience emerges from the intersection of spaces, social relations, and the materiality of technology. Whereas in the digital era, we were able to speak of cyberspace and the virtual museum as separate realms, today museums find themselves reconstituted as a cultural architecture that is made up from structures, the physical environs of the museum, its galleries, the objects held in its collection, and mediatized infrastructures, those being the dense web of media, communications, and computational technologies to which they are interconnected. In this post-digital circumstance, museums find themselves faced with a situation wherein cultural experience is being reconfigured as part of an ongoing encounter between processes, forms and content across domains and at different scales, local, translocal, global, in conjunction with the cultural and material structures wherein they take place. Simply stated, 
The core of this mediatization is found in social and cultural transformation, not in technology itself, but in what we choose to do along with it. No longer reduced to binary oppositional relationships that have structured museum digital relations to date, such as on site, online, um, you know, or on site, off site, online, offline. This presentation has proposed that the dimensions of cultural experience, spatio temporal, and, so, and techno social now operate across an increasing and expanded bandwidth of platforms, sites, and contexts that elude, evade, or even escape the imposed physical and conceptual boundaries of the art object, the gallery, or museum itself. In response, it's proposed that museums be, to be redefined as a form of cultural architecture made up of places where we can assemble to undertake important work and support different forms of critical understanding between museums, technology, and ourselves. Thank you.